Hello, I'm Julie Terrio at Stanford University, and I'm delighted to be taking part in this iBiology talk series on great problems at the interface between physics and biology. The particular problem that I would like to explore with you today is the question of how we'll go about discovering design principles for cells and organisms. And this, I think, is a very fundamental question in biology that reveals itself just when you look at any living organism. And I've shown you a few examples here at the cellular level. Way over on the left, we have one of Santiago Ramon y Cajal's beautiful drawings of neurons in the brain. In the middle, we have a light micrograph of an algae, Spirogyra, where you can see the beautiful regular helical patterns of its chloroplasts. And then over here on the right, we have the little glass exoskeleton of a diatom, which is a unicellular organism that's able to build itself this beautiful little glass house in which to live. Now, if we were to see these kinds of very precise, robust, and delicate structures in something that was built by a human, we would assume that there was un some sort of underlying design principle that the human had chosen to achieve some function, and chosen materials, and chosen the structural organization that would achieve that function. But at the level of cells, in the absence of an architect, there have to be some other kind of underlying physical principles that enable this kind of organization to emerge. Now, we can think about this problem of cellular self-organization at many different scales. And arguably, one of the first interesting places where self-organization happens in biological systems is just at the level of protein folding. And I would actually argue that at this point, we basically understand pretty well how proteins fold up. The interactions between the atoms and the, the, uh, the protein as it's folding are very familiar from fundamental physical and chemical principles. And we're using just very basic equilibrium theory. It's possible to predict the folding of a protein with an astonishing degree of precision. Certainly, there are details left to understand, but the physical principles, I would say, we do understand. But as soon as we start getting to larger scales, then things all get to be a great big mess. So if you take a bunch of these proteins and you put them together, you make a cell. If you take a bunch of cells and you put them together, you can make a multicellular organism, such as this mouse embryo shown here. And if you take a bunch of organisms and put them together, you can actually have very elaborate, larger scale kinds of biological organization. One example I'm very fond of is this termite mound shown here, which is several meters tall. And this enormous and elaborate structure with little nests and storage rooms down at the bottom, and then a big system of air conditioning built up top, is put together by little termites that are only a few millimeters long. And I would postulate that there is not a termite architect that is telling all the rest of them where to go. Instead, they're able to use just local information and local behavioral rules to put mud together to build this big structure. And I think that's a very good analogy for what must be happening at the level of the organism and at the level of the cell. So fundamentally, as we try to understand this from the level of physical principles, our equilibrium theories that work pretty well for protein folding just fail dramatically at all higher scales of organization. So one way maybe of asking this question about how we're going to discover design principles is to say, in the context of protein folding, for example, we have a privileged state, the equilibrium state. But what would the equivalent of that be for something that is like a cell or like an organism with no obvious global privileged state and yet is able to generate robust, reproducible, and precise forms. Now, that's a difficult question. And I think it becomes even more difficult and even more puzzling when you realize that, of course, almost all biological structures are not only precisely defined, but also are dynamic. There's one case where we can see this very clearly, which is uh, cell motility. Now, there are many different kinds of cells, unicellular organisms, or cells within multicellular organisms, such as humans, that are able to crawl around in a directed and purposeful way. And one of the motile cells that we work on a great deal in my group is shown here. These are cells from the skin of fish. And their structural elements can be highlighted. So for example, in uh, this image by my student, Sunny Lowe, she's used a fluorescently labeled mushroom toxin to highlight the structures of all of the actin filaments uh, within this particular cell. So in particular, over here in this movie that was made by a former student, Patricia Yam, she's used essentially the same technique to build up a little bit of texture in the lamella podium inside this living cell. So as the cell starts to crawl, what I hope you can appreciate is that the net movement of the cell arises because the meshwork is assembled at the front or at the top and then is disassembled at the back. But remarkably, those two rates are almost exactly identical to one another because the cell moves forward without changing its top to bottom length. Similarly, the rate of meshwork assembly over on the right side of the cell has got to be the same as the rate of meshwork assembly over on the left side so that it's able to move forward without turning. 
So how is it that the cell is able to put together all these very large-scale structural elements that are constantly turning over, and yet do so with such precisely balanced rates? How does it know how to make this shape? Well, we don't know the answer to that. But I hope I can at least take a step back and focus on a slightly simpler question, or what should be a slightly simpler question, to challenge you with this idea of trying to come up with physical principles that will enable cells to do things like measure length and count things and measure spacing as they're building structures. And in particular, I'd like to focus on a relatively simple case, which is when cells build structures with filaments wrapped by membrane that protrude outward from their surfaces. There are many examples in biology where cells are able to build these kinds of uh, surface protrusions that clearly have defined and measured lengths. So, for example, over on the left, this is uh, an electron micrograph of a cross-section of the surface of an intestinal epithelial cell, where you see it's covered with these little fingers that are sticking up that are all wrapped in membrane and that are, uh, enable an increase in surface area for the absorption of nutrients. Now, in the middle, we have a scanning electron micrograph of a ciliate. And this is a single-celled organism that looks all hairy. Each of these individual little hairs is a beating cilium that the cell is using to swim around. And you can see, both on the intestinal epithelium and on the ciliate, that all of these many hundreds of different surface protrusions are all really pretty much exactly the same length. So it has to have some way to measure that. Now, maybe even more interesting case that I'll come back to is uh, the stereocilia on the surface of the hair cell in the inner ear. And this little cluster of surface protrusions is what enables us to perceive motions in the air as sound within our brains. And you can see in this case that not only are these little stereocilia of perfectly well-defined length, but in fact, different stereocilia on the surface of the same cell all have different lengths. And they organize themselves in this incredibly precise staircase step pattern, like a set of organ pipes. So we want to be able to come up with some proposition of general organizational principles that can allow these kinds of structures to be built by cells. In order to do that, we need to know a little bit more about their structure. In particular, all of these surface protrusions are made by structural filaments that are bundled together and then wrapped around by membrane. And those filaments themselves are also assembled from smaller subunits. And in the cases that we're going to be talking about, these uh, filaments are actually self-assembled by multiple different copies of identical subunits. And to a first approximation, the same sort of simple equilibrium theories that enable us to describe protein folding can also enable us to describe these very simple sorts of protein-protein interactions that build, in this case, helical filaments with just many copies of the same subunit interacting over and over again. In these simple systems, we can also precisely measure aspects of their rates and of their turnover. And so for actin filaments uh, that, we're, that we're focused on today, uh, there have been a couple of really very beautiful experiments uh, measuring precisely all of the rates that govern their self-assembly and behavior. So for example, in this one uh, very famous study from Tom Pollard done in 1986, he was able to measure the on rate and the off rate of individual subunits landing on the ends of the filaments, uh, both on the two structurally distinct ends and also as a function of whether the subunits contain ATP or ADP. So all of those numbers are known. OK, so if you have a system like this where you have a bunch of protein subunits that are able to self-associate, is that something that just by itself can give you a well-defined length? Well, the answer actually is no. It's very clearly no. It's been uh, shown experimentally and also described theoretically that if you have this kind of self-assembling subunits, then the, the default length distribution is going to be exponential. And the fundamental reason for that is that each little subunit doesn't know what the rest of the filament is doing. Its behavior is governed just by these local rates, these local interactions. But because each one of those addition and loss reactions is essentially independent, the exponential distribution is the default. So we can get some aspects of filament structure, in particular its diameter and also its dynamics, defined by just the structure of the protein subunits that make it up. But for length, if we want the length to be some precisely defined number, there has to be some other mechanism for determining that. Now, of course, inside of living cells, uh, filamentous proteins never operate on their own. Uh, there are always lots and lots of other proteins, in fact, hundreds or possibly even thousands of other proteins that interact with these cytoskeletal filament structures in order to determine their behavior. And this is a textbook illustration of just a few of the different kinds of proteins that affect cytoskeletal filaments. And the details here aren't important, but the basic idea is just for every aspect of dynamics or structure of these filamentous proteins, there is some other protein that is able to interact with those subunits and regulate their behavior. 
So there are other proteins that can regulate the on rate and the off rates of the, the subunits of the ends. They can bind to the filaments and regulate their stability. They can force the filaments to bundle together, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so now if we know that there are other proteins that will interact with these filament forming proteins, and we go back to our problem of how do you set a defined length, you might imagine that a really easy way to do it would be just to have a protein whose job it is to determine that length. And in fact, there are some cases in biology where we know that that happens. One very well characterized case is in bacteriophage lambda. So this is a kind of virus that infects bacteria. And it makes these um, spectacular little sort of landing pod structures. And there is a tail that is part of this structure where if you look at that tail in many different uh, individual virus particles, as you can see in the micrograph, those tails are all the same length. And it's been shown that there is a protein called the H protein, a big long protein, whose length determines the length of that tail. Internal in-frame deletions that make the protein shorter also make the tail shorter. And duplications that make the protein longer also make the tail longer. So that's great. But it doesn't have to be a protein that acts as the template. It could be a different sort of macromolecule. And in fact, there are other viruses, such as tobacco mosaic virus shown here, that instead of using a protein to determine their length, they use the RNA genome to determine the length. But the idea is still the same. If you have a template, that's a great way to solve this problem. But of course, we're not done. Because the bottom line is this really simple, elegant idea of having a template simply doesn't work in any of those cases that I showed you, in the intestinal microvilli, in the cilia on the surface of the swimming organism, or in the stereocilia on the surface of the hair cell. So what determines length in those kinds of cases? And it's got to be something that's dynamic. So let's focus in particular on these hair, hair cell stereocilia. Because uh, I think this is just a, an exquisitely beautiful piece of biology that's actually filled with really, really interesting questions in physics. Now, the organization of the stereocilia, as I showed you before, is in bundles where each individual uh, protrusion is a defined length. And they're organized in such a way that the protrusions line up uh, so that they're each next to a neighbor that's slightly longer. And the reason why that's important is because every pair of neighboring filaments of different length in the structure is attached by a little structure called a tip link. And when these hair cells in the inner ear um, have the, the tips of the, those bundles bent by the movements of membranes that react essentially to uh, fluid flow that comes downstream of the bouncing around of the eardrum, then the movement of those um, stereocilia relative to one another causes the slightly longer uh, stereocilium to slide with respect to its slightly shorter neighbor. And so tugging on that tip link then opens ion channels that enable changes in membrane polarization, which can eventually be perceived as an electrical signal and interpreted as sound by the brain. OK, so it's obvious that it's very important that the stereocilia be built a certain length in a certain pattern on the surface of the cell. And also, actually, it turns out that they be tuned to different frequencies so that you can hear both high pitches and low pitches. And I wanted to share with you just an absolutely astonishing study that was done uh, by Lou Tilney and his colleagues back in the 1980s uh, that I think shows the magnitude of this problem and how difficult it really is going to be to try to understand how it works. And what they did here was a, a simple but extremely painstaking series of experiments where they dissected out the cochlea from newborn chicks and then used scanning electron microscopy to examine the hair cells in different parts of the cochlea. So at one end, there are hair cells that are tuned to hear high frequencies. At the other end, hair cells tuned to hear low frequencies, and then graded frequency determination in between. And what they found is if they looked at the end that could hear high frequencies, they found these short, little, stiff, stubby stereocilia. But if they looked at the end of the cochlea that was tuned to hear long frequencies, they found these long, elegant, sort of floppy stereocilia. OK, that's pretty cool. But the really amazing part is they then went ahead and measured the total number of actin filaments, the total length of those filaments, the total surface area of membrane that wrapped around all these things for all of these different cells throughout the cochlea. And it turned out that those numbers were absolutely conserved. So there were 90,000 microns of actin filaments making up each of these very different kinds of structures. There's 180 square microns of membrane that's wrapped around each of these very different kinds of structures. And yet, each individual cell tunes the overall length, number, and spacing of these stereocilia to be able to hear the pitch that it's intended to hear. So what this means is that you know, every single one of these cells basically started with the same Lego kit. It had the same number of structural proteins, the same amount of membrane. And yet, each cell chose to arrange them in slightly different ways 
depending on where it was in the cochlea and what pitch it wanted to hear. Now, we don't understand how that works. Not only do we not understand in detail how the length of these structures can be set, but we also don't understand how those lengths can be so finely tuned in order to achieve this kind of biological specificity. Now, that's just one example. But I think it opens up this huge can of worms about how we can go about understanding cell structure determination. And I think this is a subset of the very general question raised by Schrodinger of what is life? Certainly, life has to obey physical and chemical principles. But there are additional principles that I believe we have not yet discovered that are necessary to describe these kinds of processes that we see inside of living cells and organisms. And cells are very complicated. The inside of a cell is extremely crowded, as you can see in this electron micrograph reconstruction. It's very inhomogeneous. Everything is constantly far away from equilibrium. And its material properties are very weird. It's not viscous. It's not elastic. It's not plastic. It's some combination of all those things and actually can change its material properties over time. So with all this kind of weirdness and complexity and strange material properties, how are the cells nevertheless able to build these exquisitely regular, beautiful structures that we see all the time? Well, I think it's very clear that equilibrium thermodynamics and statistical mechanics are not going to get us there. It's a good first step. But it's not going to really be able to describe the physical principles for cell organization in a, living, in a real living system. And I'd like to propose that one way to really try to get at this and to start building a general theory of the cell is to start with questions that seem like they might be relatively simple. How do cells measure things? How do cells count things? And the hope is that once we understand the principles underlying those kinds of relatively simple processes, we should be able to put them together to understand robust and dynamic cell organization also in more complex contexts. In complex contexts for the life of the individual cell, and also in order to build a whole multicellular organism such as ourselves. And at some point, I hope that if we understand these physical principles and these organizational principles well enough, then we should be able to also engineer them and be able to get the cells to build structures that we choose rather than just building the structures that they choose. Thank you.